Well, this is Dr. Churchill. This is Astronomy 308, End of the Final Frontier. We are in Module 2, the Space Race, and we are now going to be talking today about the Space Shuttle era and Skylab. So without much further to do, I am going to share my slides. Okay. Okay, so this is my uh, opening slide discussing the fact that we're going to talk about Skylab and the space shuttle era. The Skylab uh, era was from 1973 to 1979. We're going to discuss its three crewed missions. And um, it's basically something that used a lot of Apollo hardware, sometimes was known as the Apollo Applications Project. And then uh, the space shuttle era, which really the first launch of the space shuttle was in 1981, even though it was envisioned as early as 1969 um, and pushed through the budget of Congress in the, in the early 70s. And then uh, didn't fly till 1981 and then was uh, final flight was in 2011. So let's move on to the space shuttle or the Skylab era. So um, Skylab was the United States' first space station and literally, except for the International Space Station, uh, was the only uh, United States space station. Uh, it was the second actual space station by uh, any nation, meaning that the, the Soviets had beat the United States with their Salute 1. But um, it, nonetheless, it was a a way of having a permanent presence in orbit, particularly civilian science, rather than a military presence in orbit. Uh, the call sign for the spacecraft was Skylab. There were three uh, crew per mission and um, uh, only nine crew in total uh, actually were on Skylab. It launched on May 14th in 1973 from uh, Cape Kennedy and then it re-entered the atmosphere in a glorious burning up a fireball um, on July 11th in 1979. And uh, some pieces actually fell um, on the mainland of Australia. Okay. Um, the uh, thing about Skylab is that it was envisioned by Werner von Braun as a cheap and easy way to take one of the leftover Saturn V boosters and use it for a large project, a space project. Now, as you know, um, missions planned up to Apollo 20 were on the books before the budget cuts. So there were three remaining Saturn V boosters that had not been used. And so one of them got refurbished basically into Skylab and they effectively used the S4B booster hollowed out uh, and turned that into a living space and a science space. On the right here are the original notes actually proposed by Werner von Braun as early as 1964, he was dreaming this up. So Skylab, as we said, launched on um, the 11th of July in 1979, and that was called the Skylab 1 mission or SL1. So the crewed missions even start with SL2, that was be the first manned mission, SLM for Skylab manned. And the SL3 mission, SLM2, was um, the second group of astronauts and then the, the third group of astronauts, SL4. Now, interestingly, uh, Skylab's first commander of the first crew was our famous astronaut from Apollo 12, Pete Conrad. And Pete Conrad, uh, this was his last space mission, but um, he was in charge of uh, this group of three astronauts with Joe Kerwin and Paul Weitz. And they flew uh, on the, um, gosh, um, they, they flew about 10 days or 11 days after the Skylab mission took uh, into orbit. And it was uh, planned that they were gonna launch much sooner than that, but when Skylab lifted off, it had a little bit of a problem in that there's a heat shield along the side of the spacecraft uh, and it tore off during max Q when this rock, when the Saturn V was going through the atmosphere. And so this really caused a problem. And the other thing that was damaged was 
the solar panels. And when one of them unfurled, it didn't unfurl. And so therefore, there were two problems. One, that when it was Skylab was in orbit, it overheated inside because of this heat shield that was uh, scraped off. And number two, it wasn't able to be fully powered. So it was not going to be realized as the full station without the electricity. So both of these had to be fixed if the mission was to be salvaged. One of the main things that it had was that it had a solar observatory. And the other part is that it had an earth observatory. And then it also had ultraviolet uh, observatories because ultraviolet light does not pass through the atmosphere. And so being able to observe the universe in ultraviolet light was uh, a, a big boon for astronomy. So here's the launch of the Skylab and you can see it, you know, it's a classic Saturn V launcher, except that you don't have your Apollo spacecraft on the top with your escape tower, but you have the Skylab um, mission itself or, or living area inside this S4B um, part of the booster. And it's this part along the side and the heat shield that scraped off and then some of the um, damage to the solar panels. Here's an artist's conception of what Skylab would look like in its full glory. And you can see there's some solar panels off the side of the S4B on both sides. And then there's this little tower here, which would then unfold and these would fold out. You can see the folds in them. And it was basically these parts, uh, one of these on the side that broke and that was a real problem. You can see the docking ring here with the Apollo spacecraft with the command module and the service module. And you can see there's a, a great deal of, of living room here um, that, that exists in basically three floors. Now, I, I've got a video hooked to this module that I want you to watch. It's, um, a, a, it starts out kind of um, cheesy with this guy in a bow tie talking about his story and stuff like that. But then it really gets quite good. There's a lot of... Um, uh, you know, footage of the astronauts in their spacewalks, there's footage of the astronauts inside, there's footage of the launch. So I hope you can get past sort of the, the silly beginning of the video and enjoy that. So here is the uh, manned crew one, SLM-1, which is, they, they actually call themselves Skylab-1 on their patch, but as you know, there's this sort of uh, synchronicity with the naming. Okay, so they, they rendezvoused with uh, Skylab on their fifth orbit. Um, they, they came, they knew they were going to have to make substantial repairs, so they delayed their launch 10 days and um, figured out how they were going to do this. And really what they came up with is sort of this uh, parasol that they tied down with rope that was uh, able to then absorb the heat. And so you may see these pictures of Skylab where it has this uh, big cloth on the outside of it. And that was done by the spacewalk with Pete Conrad, okay? Um, when they first got there, uh, it was something like 104 degrees or 140 degrees inside the Skylab. So they really couldn't stay in there. So they eventually were able to get it cooled down to about 75 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit, which is, you know, a reasonable temperature to work in. Okay, so by June 4th, they got it pretty much fully operational. Uh, they started conducting their solar astronomy and earth resources experiments. They were doing medical uh, studies. They did some experiments that students had given them, and they did the ultraviolet uh, experiments. In, altogether, all the crews did about 2,000 hours worth of, of science and uh, did about 10 spacewalks. Uh, this particular mission completed about 404 orbits. They did about 392 of those experimental hours, as well as three of those uh, extra, extra vehicular activities, of which there were 10 in total. And so here's a, a pre-launch uh, picture. You can see our hero, Pete Conrad, here. Here's Pete Conrad taking a shower and then you can see what kind of living area it was. I hope that in the future, when we go to space, it's going to be a lot more comfortable than that. And then here's Pete Conrad out on one of his spacewalks. Here's the second crewed um, mission. And uh, the commander of this crew was Alan Bean, 
Alan Bean, believe it or not, flew with Pete Conrad on Apollo 12 and walked on the moon with Pete Conrad on Apollo 12. And if you read Andrew Chaikin's book, you'll see that when they were on the far side of the moon, Pete Conrad actually let Alan Bean fly the lunar landing module, which was not in the rule book, but there's a whole bunch of great stuff in Andrew Chaikin's book about that. So you can see that, uh, here they are in a training facility. They're obviously not in zero G here. This is a training facility, but once they got up there, they really enjoyed floating around and doing their zero G. And then here is one of the spacewalks is on the night side, you can see this beautiful uh, glowing from the sun here and uh, in your typical meal. Um, they did a thousand hours and um, they completed uh, 858 orbits and EVAs that lasted about 13 hours, and they did three of those. And so here we have the last Skylab mission. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to add about this uh, Skylab mission, I'm going to go back to their slide. This Skylab mission was known for the crew being highly efficient. They worked around the clock, they accomplished everything and more. Every time something additional was thrown at them by Houston. They said they just willingly did it. And Alan Bean and this crew were just, you know, go-getters. They, and, and we're talking about seven days a week, working hard all of the time. And this crew just really was good at, at that. And it was interesting that the reason I bring that up is because when we come to the third crew, it turned out to be the exact opposite. I mean, this crew kind of mutinied and said, you know, there are days where we are just, we're not going to work. Okay, so see this flight plan you've got? No, oh, I'm putting it down and we're not working because we're not rats in a lab. And so there is really this different psychological energy coming from this team. And NASA had to learn a lot. This is the first time that they put humans in space for these long duration missions. And so there was a lot that was being learned here about different individuals, different teams, and what you could really push people to do and what people would be willing to be pushed to do. So um, this is a, a, a really neat um, crew because they got a chance to watch and observe this comet Kohotek, which if you were around in those days was very bright in the sky, was quite special. Um, they completed 1,214 orbits, did four extravehicular activities and um, mopped up the rest of the science experiments. I think this crew really, um, each crew stayed longer and broke more records than the last. And of course, uh, when Skylab 3 had, uh, that mission had ended, uh, they had all of the records in hand, these three men. Here's just base, a basic um, lineup of some of the experiments they did. So the, the point here was that they had lists and lists of experiments to do, uh, medical to telescope to science, including growing crystals and things like that, technological things that they had to experiment with. Uh, here's this growth of the spherical crystals, for example, and then earth resources experiments. So they did a lot of study of the planet and observed the planet in infrared and and bands that could not be done and with resolutions that had never been done before. And, you know, this is the first time of a permanent uh, laboratory in space. So it, it really was the first of everything. Very exciting. We look back at it now and it's sort of, you know, something from the 70s and old school technology, but it was high tech at the time. And if there's anything you've learned from this class going from the beginning of the sea race till now is that it's just it's this constant march of getting more technology and better and better at doing these things so that we look back and we think gosh you know how quaint was that but look at our world today and people will look back in 100 years and say how quaint is that i mean you had to drive your car you know your phone was actually uh, you had to hold it in your hand when it wasn't you know networked into your brain all kinds of things that are going to change. And they'll look back and think how quaint our, our high tech world is. And the other thing that was really nice was they did a lot of student experiments. So that was really great because if you were a student and you proposed to have an experiment done on the Skylab, of course, that was a, a wonderful thing um, for students to experience. You can imagine how excited you would be if you had an experiment and it was being done by NASA. Um, 
Now, in the end, um, I'm not quite sure why they, after the third mission, they ceased to send up astronauts to man Skylab. And uh, it, it laid empty for a long time. And the, the hope was that the um, space shuttle would then be able to go back and forth to Skylab. And in fact, Skylab was in an orbit that was known that it would decay. And unfortunately, the timing of that decay was accelerated in the sense that uh, there was a lot of solar activity. And so the Earth's atmosphere had expanded a little bit further than normal, which increased the drag on the spacecraft and that slowed it down and then its orbit decayed sooner than was originally projected. One of the things that uh, was thought was that uh, maybe they could send up a robotic uh, jet pack that could then dock automatically with Space Lab and then fire some retro rockets and, and move it up to a higher orbit. In the end, uh, none of these proposals were funded and attempted, and the space shuttle was, its uh, maiden flight was delayed, and there was no chance uh, Skylab was just left to its own devices, and so it finally um, burned up into the uh, atmosphere. And so when it did so, um, one of the hot spots of debris that, that hit the ground with here was in the southwest of Australia. Here's a gentleman who picked up a piece. I believe that the, there was a, an award that was put out for whoever can produce the first piece of Skylab. And then there's a joke about how uh, some county in Australia had billed NASA some money uh, saying, you know, you had littered and it cost us this money to pick it up and we're charging you for that. Uh, that was kind of a joke, but um, who knows if they're really serious. Um, anyway, it was calculated that things should land in the Indian Ocean, and that didn't quite actually work out. And so, um, you know, the debris odds were something like one in 152, um, or for, if you, for any one person, the chances were one in 600 billion that you would get hit by one of these uh, pieces of um, debris. And, you know, winning the lottery uh, for the the million dollar lottery is like one in 300 million. So the chances of you winning the lottery are a lot better than you getting hit by a piece of Skylab when it fell from the sky. Okay, let's switch gears and go to the space shuttle. So I'm not gonna talk about this in a lot of detail, but the space shuttle in the end, uh, I think is considered to be a disaster. Now, when, NASA had proposed in 1969, 1968, the future beyond Apollo. There was great vision. And in fact, again, I'm gonna, I have you watching another video from the Curious Droid um, where he talks about all of the different plans that NASA had proposed to the US government as to what it was going to do. And literally we're talking about a network of low earth orbit, high earth orbit, cis-lunar transport orbiting around uh, the moon and going down with permanent stations on the moon, just a whole network back and forth, kind of like in a sense when they built the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States. And then of course there were lots of side spur tracks that got you to New York or Chicago and whatnot. But the point was you could get all the way to California, which is like going to the moon back then, and you could go then come back along this, this route. So this cross-continental railroad would be similar to like what you might call a cis-lunar transport um, rocket or they call them tugs. And this was all designed and built in the space shuttle was meant to be this reusable um, craft that, that could go up into earth orbit and bring you back down and get you connected to this space highway to the moon and then the space highway to the moon would get you connected to the, the shuttles that would take you up and down from the surface of the moon. Anyway, that just got completely scrapped and the only thing that got left over was the space shuttle and then its budget got cut by tremendous amounts. And so it really ended up being a complete design change that ended up being very dangerous. And it turned out to be not very, um, cost effective, there is a huge discrepancy between what they predicted is the cost per pound or kilogram per payload, which was on the order of 
less than $200 and ended up in the end, the calculation was that it turned out to be something like $25,000 when it was all said and done. And this is all analyzed after the space shuttle program ended. So that's sort of my overview of the space shuttle program. Um, at the time I lived through the space shuttle, it was very exciting at first, very exciting at first. And um, when the first space shuttle blew up, and all the astronauts were killed, of course, it was highly shocking. On the other hand, I was young um, in college about your age, and I was extremely disappointed that we weren't doing all those other things. So the space shuttle to me did feel like we had given up on space. And um, I was kind of depressed about it. And in fact, my generation is known as the orphans of Apollo. You know, We grew up with Apollo as children. We had this idea that by the time we were in our 40s, we would be working in space on Van, Von Braun space stations and traveling back and forth to the moon. And that humans would be pushing the boundaries into the solar system. And none of that happened and it's still not happening. So um, our generation is known as the, as the orphans of Apollo. Anyhow, let's talk about the space shuttle. First thing I want you to know is the space shuttle is a LEO orbiter. It only goes to low Earth orbit. And so since the 1980s, we have been confined to low Earth orbit. And so it, this is kind of like saying, oh, I'm just going to sort of dog paddle in the shallow end of the pool when the pool you know, goes for miles. And we really have limited ourselves. Getting to space, it's not that far to get up to space. It just takes a lot of energy to go up there. But in fact, Space is on the order of about 155 miles to 600 miles. Well, I shouldn't say that space is up there. Space is about 100 miles. But the fact is that the space shuttle flies in orbits that are about 155 to 600 miles. Now, it's 140 miles to Socorro from Las Cruces. I'm giving this lecture from Las Cruces. And if you happen to not be in my class and happen to be watching, and Socorro is just straight north, about 140 miles. And we know that takes, what, two hours and some change to drive up there. So when you think about it, a two hour or two and a half hour drive, that's not very far. And yet that's all it is to get up to the lowest orbit that the space shuttle goes. Now, um, if you wanted to drive from Las Cruces to 600 miles, then that's about the, the distance to Denver. Again, it's not a terribly, that's a 10 hour drive, I think not a terribly long distance. Okay, um, so this is a good example here of the uh, space shuttle orbits. And what I want you to understand is that, you know, the shuttle takes off here from Cape Canaveral and ends up going up in an orbit that has a tilt to it. Okay, and so this is an example of some tilted orbits that go along the south equator and the north equator. Now, this is, actually what, this is actually the range of orbits that the space shuttle goes in. It's just, it looks funny that, well, they don't go over Cape Canaveral. Well, that's not exactly right, because if the Earth rotates around, you'll see, in fact, that the space shuttle could have taken off and come up on this orbit and stayed on that orbit. And so, yeah, these are the orbits that you see for the shuttle. They're tilted with respect to the equator. And it turns out that the Hubble Space Telescope is in this particular orbit, okay? And that the uh, International Space Station is in this particular orbit. And the space shuttle can reach both of these orbits. Now, remember that you have to get up to about 17,500 miles an hour in order to be in orbit. And uh, that when you are in orbit, you go around the Earth about once every 90 minutes, about once every hour and a half. So here are all the patches from all of the um, space shuttle missions. Now, you'll see they're called STS and then a number. And STS-1, for example, STS stands for Space Transport System, in a sense it was kind of like a truck. And I've got some images here of the pre and post flight astronauts for STS-1, which was the Columbia, which uh, took off in 1981. And John Young was the commander with Robert, Robert Crippen. And John Young is uh, famous from Gemini 3. 
corned beef sandwich story. And then he uh, flew, flew Commander Gemini 10 with Mike Collins. Then he flew as command module pilot. Apollo 10 went to the moon, uh, orbited the moon, and then was commander of Apollo 16, in which he walked on the moon. And then he got to pilot and command the first space shuttle launch. And unlike all previous NASA manned or crewed missions, the space shuttle never flew without a crew. Its first full up test, you know, shakedown was a crewed mission. Um, and this is actually, uh, was quite considered to be quite risky. Okay, so then here's Young and Crippen uh, when they're old and gray, you know, with their wisdom. And uh, interestingly, if you're a Rush fan, they have a song on their album called Signals, and that song is called Countdown, and it's basically a song about the uh, Young and Crippen flight. Uh, they actually, the, the group went to the launch pad, uh, met the astronauts, and watched the launch, and wrote a song about it. Um, at first, the missions were called one, two, three, four, five, and then as they got to the point where they realized we don't wanna have an STS-13. We have to come up with some kind of naming scheme so that we never have an STS-13 because you know, NASA being the consummate scientists that not being superstitious at all, did not want another mission 13 given what happened to Apollo 13. So they, they renamed them in such a way that they ended up having things like 32S and 51L and it turned out that the uh, Challenger um, accident mission that was called 51L. And eventually I, they gave up on that when they got far enough away from 13 and sort of were looking back at that number 13 and they said, okay, we can go back to numbered missions. And um, so along the right there, um, we have the final mission here with the Atlantis orbiter and that was STS-135. And um, then you have the crew here that's come and was able to visit with President Obama in the White House give them some patches and some souvenirs that had been in space. And that was the end of the space shuttle mission. Um, I actually know one person quite well who flew on STS-90. Uh, he was a, a kinesiology professor at Penn State named Jim Powelsik, and he proposed an experiment called NeuroLab. And so NASA said, you know what, why don't you PI the NeuroLab and fly and the guy got to become an astronaut and fly in the space shuttle. I'm not jealous. So Jim, if you're watching this, hi, I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, this is a great night photo of the space shuttle on the launch pad. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about its anatomy and uh, engineering in the next couple slides. But the bottom line is that you have an orbiter. It has some main engines. It has some reaction control thrust, thrusters, or what's called the RCS, the reaction control system. These are small thrusters about, which then allow it to roll, allow it to pitch, allow it to uh, yaw. And then of course, the main engines can be used to, to change the orbit of the orbiter so that it actually can rendezvous and then dock with other spacecraft. Um, to get it off the ground, you need a lot of power and you need a lot of fuel. So the main engines use the fuel that's in this uh, fuel tank, it's called the um, external tank, and it has a lot of liquid hydrogen and a lot of liquid oxygen in it. And then these are the solid rocket boosters that are strapped on to the sides of the uh, external tank. And um, I think I mentioned this in the previous lecture that once you ignite a, a solid rocket booster, it is ignited until all of the fuel is spent. So once they're turned on, you can't throttle them, you can't throttle them up, you can't throttle them down, and you cannot turn them off. So you, once you light them, you are go until they're done. So here's a nice, beautiful launch. And I can tell you that this is STS-1. And the reason I can is because STS-1 is the only space shuttle. Uh, no, I think there was one more, two more. Um, actually, the second one, I think, may have had it. I was corrected one time when I said it, so that's why I'm I'm hedging my bet here that this, the uh, external tank was painted white, and then they decided that they want, didn't want to paint it white anymore because I forget how many pounds that paint was, but they figured why should we compromise the weight of the spacecraft with paint? Uh, so let's not paint the darn thing. <laughs> 
Here we're coming in as a launch, uh, sorry, as a, as a landing. This looks like it's uh, one of the landings at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And the thing about the shuttle coming in for a landing was that uh, it came in on a dead stick. It was really a glider. And so that meant it had one chance to land and it really felt like a brick out of the sky. And so it had uh, four computers that actually, um, it may have been actually five computers, four that did a calculation. Um, and then if, the, if two agreed with the other, with each other and two agree with each other, but disagree with the other two, then the fifth computer was used as the tiebreaker. Anyway, all that was going on as it's coming in and landing and, and, and doing all of its various uh, flight control. Okay, so the anatomy of an orbiter. Okay, again, we see the external tank and so you can see the inside where you have the liquid oxygen here at the top and the liquid hydrogen down here in the bottom. Here's the solid rocket booster, and here's where the, the fuel, which is sort of like a gooey gel, very flammable gooey gel, is encased inside these um, solid rocket boosters. Then you have the orbiter with its main engines. This is then what you call the payload area, and this was really quite large. It was designed to put satellites in it that they could be uh, the doors would open and the satellites could come out and then uh, the satellites would be spun up and then their rockets would fire and they could be sent up to different orbits. And um, of course, then you had the crew cabin here. And again, you have reaction control system uh, thrusters everywhere throughout the, on, on the orbiter that, that would give you this control. Um, instead of having a heat shield like the bottom of the Apollo or the bottom of Gemini and the bottom of Mercury, Basically, it had a series of tiles along the bottom, and the tiles then would individually uh, be heated up, and they would absorb the heat and not transmit it to the, to the actual fuselage of the orbiter. Here's a beautiful little picture of what it would be like to work in the orbiter. Um, it has definitely two decks, an upper and a lower deck, and um, so when more than, I think it was four astronauts flew, the other three astronauts had to take off in the lower deck, so they were literally taking off downstairs with no windows, which that would be unfortunate. I think it would be great to sit in the pilot seat. Um, maybe I'm wrong in that. Yeah, well, I think they've gotten to the point where they, yeah, here they are, the three. Second guessing myself again. So here's the flight deck at the top. You can see the windows here, the two pilots, and the commander and pilot can sit here and look out the windows, then you have your two upstairs passengers, usually um, what they would call a mission specialist. And then if you had additional people, they would be in the mid deck and then the two here and one there. So up to seven on the crew. And then here's cutaway of what the flight deck looked like, what the mid deck looked like, and then uh, lower deck, which is more, more of a storage deck actually. Here's an example of the space shuttle from the side with some cutaway. Um, Really, I just wanted to show you this. You can see where the wheels uh, are compressed inside, the cutaway of, say, the, the pumps and the engines uh, for the engines. And then um, I'm hoping that they can see the reaction control system here, but I think they, you can't really see them. OK, so um, then you have a rudder just like an airplane. You know, it's really quite an interesting vehicle. And it's hard for me to describe it all in one shot. That there is a little um, area here, which is a port for uh, spacewalking. So down here in the mid deck, the astronauts would suit up and they would come out this port here and then they could climb along inside the uh, payload. And uh, once in a while there would be uh, a payload that would be actually mated to the uh, spacecraft and it would be something it would be called actually a, a space lab and and so instead of going through that port and going out into space you would walk into it and it would be a much bigger larger facility in which you could do science experiments here's what the cockpit looks like and it may look a lot more modern than a um than a uh, spacecraft that we saw from the 60s, i.e. the Apollo Command Module or the uh, Gemini space capsule. 
And in fact, it was. But a lot of this technology was frozen in in the early 70s. And the technology uh, by the 1980s had completely stripped it away. So you can imagine when they were flying the space shuttle in the early 2000s and the late 2000s, and, the, and you get in there and you're literally dealing with 1970s technology, which must have seemed pretty clunky and slow. Of course, they always upgraded the computer chips and made the computers faster and did this type of thing. But overall, you're pretty much locked into some 1970s technology. Now, if you've ever seen the inside of Dragon, SpaceX's Dragon space capsule, you will see what the difference is between today's technology and the space shuttle technology. And so I, I recommend that you Google that and look that up. And of course, later in the class, I'll be showing you some internal views of spacecraft Dragon. Here's some classic images taken over the years of the space shuttle program. What I was telling you before, where you can put a satellite in the, um, the uh, cargo bay or the payload bay, and then you release them, then they would spin up with some gyroscopes, then this rocket would fire and it could go up into its own orbit. Okay. Um, sometimes the, the uh, astronauts would learn to fix things. And at first, at first, the astronauts didn't get out for many of the first missions in the 80s. It wasn't until later that in the 90s that they started to really um, go out and fix things. And one of the most um, celebrated repairs is the Hubble Space Telescope, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, um, one of the big deals of the 80s was the jetpack, sort of, uh, we've talked about the, the Buck Rogers jetpack. This is the uh, jetpack of Bruce McCandless flying this in the, in the, I think it's around 1985 or 1986. This was the first time a human had orbited the Earth floating freely and uh, was not tethered to a spacecraft. So this, is, this was really an um, exciting moment. What this allowed you to do then was that if the space shuttle would come and rendezvous within, say, you know, 100 yards or more of an orbiting spacecraft that, say, had gotten sick, then... Um, you could go out in your jetpack over to the space shuttle or the, the um, satellite. And then if you had some kind of device to latch onto it, then you could then spin with it and then try to unspin it. And then, then they built this, um, Canada had built this shuttle uh, arm that could then reach out and grab it and then pull it back in. So these images are showing little bits and pieces of all of this. So. Once we learn how to do this, what, what Bruce McCandless did, this is a gentleman by the name of Pinky Nelson, and this is the Solar Max satellite. And it was a, a very important uh, solar observatory that had gone south. And uh, one of the first space shuttle missions for repairing satellites was to fix the Solar Max. And so there was a little mating ring that uh, Pinky Nelson had, and he flew over there and hooked onto it, stopped it from spinning, it didn't go smoothly at first, trust me. It's, he kind of knock, knocked it out of its whack and it spun out of control and they had to kind of figure out how to get that back. But they got through that and they eventually used the uh, Canadian arm to grab it. Here's a picture of the, the arm and you can see that sometimes astronauts would take uh, some time to go out there uh, and then that they could do the other things. And I'll tell you a great story in a minute. Here is the Hubble Space Telescope after it had been captured by the arm or in the process of being captured by the arm. And then it can slowly be brought down and brought into the bay or put in the bay on its side and the astronauts can go out and do that. Now, an interesting thing that happened with that is very similar to this picture here. And there, there was this astronaut, I can't remember her name, but she was repairing the Hubble on the very first Hubble mission, and she had to take off the broken solar panels that hadn't unfurled because they were gonna replace them with some new ones. And she took off the old ones and she was holding them. And she's out on the end of the arm like this, the telescope's off to the side here, and she's holding these, this huge you know, set of solar panels and what they decided to do was that they were gonna use the reaction control systems on the shuttle to move it so that she would be 
pulled in a certain direction. And when they fired the rocket, she was supposed to let go of the solar panels and therefore she would be pulled away from them. And uh, that worked. And she has described that moment as being just a fantastic experience watching these things vibrate as they moved away as she got accelerated away with the space shuttle. And then she watched this thing disappear into the distance. So it's really amazing to think what these astronauts experienced while they were working in space like this. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine being in the underbelly of a satellite like this while orbiting the Earth at 18,000 miles per hour, uh, you know, 150 miles up. Now, uh, we must celebrate the first uh, American woman in space. You may have heard of her. Her name is Sally Ride. Uh, she is now deceased but she was the first uh, American woman to fly in space and in the space shuttle mission. It was not until 2000 and I don't know exactly, but mid 2000s or early 2000s maybe uh, that um, a woman by the last name of Collins uh, became the first commander of the space shuttle. Here's the International Space Station and you can see that here's how the uh, space shuttle actually docks. So it has this sort of L ring here, this, the, that area that I told you the astronauts come out and then they can come in through the port on the um, International Space Station. Now, I think I told you before that we're spoiled in movies, you know, it's sort of like, it looks like, okay, I'm gonna dock with that. You come up and you, you know, you zip in there and you land in some bay or, you, you know, you watch Star Wars and they just they just dock and, and get out of the spacecraft. But no, this is the kind of thing where, the, the, the mass of these things is so huge. They're like, you know, ocean liners in the ocean. They don't just stop on a dime. And so you have to come in at just creeping speeds and it takes hours to do these dockings, just get everything lined up. And then of course, two of the other quintessential images are of the two disasters. We have the Challenger disaster here where we had the explosion on takeoff and you can see that even though that the orbiter and the external tank has exploded, the solid rocket boosters, they're going to continue to fire. And so here is one solid rocket booster, here's the other, and they just kept on going. This here is the image of the Columbia in 2003 as it was re-entering the atmosphere and broke apart and the, the astronauts were burned alive in that unfortunate accident. People who lived in New Mexico actually saw this happen. They saw the, the flame and the, the uh, meteor uh, shapes of, and fireballs in the sky. And in fact, even my wife uh, witnessed this herself. This is a, a diagram that shows the number of space shuttle launches that happened. Now, they were planning on launching shuttles about um, 25 a year, 24, 25 a year, which is to say once every two weeks, they never got close to achieving that at, at all. They got to the point where the sustainability of the shuttle was maybe that they could get up to four a year if everything was working perfectly. And so it really didn't pan out as planned. So in 1981, there was two, and then they start building up and start building up, but they're already extremely short of their goal. See, now they've got nine in one year in 1985. And it turned out that they had already seen signs of danger, which led to the shuttle uh, disaster of, of, um, of um, Challenger. And uh, they'd already seen some of the signs that those problems could lead to fatalities, but they were under so much pressure to get this bar higher up to say 15 or 16 a year. And in 86, they were, you know, they were looking for completing this curve and getting up to about maybe 15 or 16 a year. And uh, by the time they got to the second one in January, kaboom, the Columbia uh, exploded and killed all on board. And so there, that stopped it. And then of course, in 1987, there was an investigation, they revamped a lot of the design, and then they built up again, but they never ever achieved their 1985 status of nine a year again. Excuse me. And they, as you can see, they added first that they had the Columbia, then the Challenger, and then they had Discovery, and then Atlantis. All four of those space shuttles were built by 1985 and flying by 1985. So they really had a flurry. And then they lost the Challenger in 86. 
and then they brought the Endeavor in in 1992. This is a, a timeline of the life of the uh, space shuttle program from 81 to 2011. This is when Columbia started and when it ended, when it burned up uh, in, the, in the sky over New Mexico and Texas. This is the Challenger, uh, had an early demise and then Discovery had a long flight path and Atlantis and then the Endeavor. And of course, Atlantis was our last mission in 2011. So let's talk about that Challenger accident. This happened in January of 28, 1986. And if you remember, this is eerily close to January 27 uh, with, uh, of 1967, which was the fire for Apollo 1. Okay, so the solid rocket boosters failed on the Challenger accident. And this is why, in short, there are segments to the solid rocket booster. So here's the example of the segments. And the segments are the weak points uh, of the structural integrity. And so they lock in together and they have a pin here which locks them in together. You can see the side cutaway. And um, then what you have is you have some putty that exists in here and you have some O-rings that go around um, and seal these, gaps, if you will, at the joints. And the O-rings sit right here and right here. So you can see they're, they're, they're literally, literally uh, rings that are about that big around and they go around the rocket like that and they're embedded in between the inner and the outer joint there. And really what they're there to do is to stop something called blow-by. So here's this putty and so this, the fuel is very hot and burning in this area, and there's pressure here. And if there was no putty, obviously the gases, the hot gases would come up through here, okay? So the putty is there to help stop that. And then the O-rings here uh, stick out from the inner uh, um, joint to the outer joint and cause a rubber seal. And this is to stop something called blow-by. So if the putty fails, then these right here are supposed to stop the gases from coming down. Sorry, I'm supposed to stop the gases from coming down. I don't know why I've got that going there. Okay, coming down through this joint. So you have the first O ring and then you have the second O ring. And then if it blows by, it can come back out and um, basically you can get a leak. And so the bad thing about a flame coming out of this is if the flame actually then um, goes against the, the, the external tank, and then you have a flame on your liquid hydrogen, and of course, that's going to be a bomb. And this is exactly what happened. So on the morning that they flew the space shuttle, the temperatures had been sub-freezing all night long. And so there were icicles on the launch pad. And the engineers stayed up all night saying, should we launch, should we not launch? The engineer said, don't launch. Management said, let's launch. The management won that argument. Um, and there was a lot of unethical things that, that came out of this um, through the study about how management works. And um, in the end, um, the poor astronauts didn't survive this. So the, the O-rings in that, extreme cold became very stiff. So they no longer were pliable rubber. So when, when the uh, blow-by started to happen here, the, these rings were just useless. They were just like rock, solid rock, and uh, had no resistance. And so the blow-by happened. And uh, you can see here that the space shuttle had a plume that came out immediately showing that, that this leak and this integrity of the seal was broken. And as we're flying here during the launch, you can see that actually this plume is coming out in the O-ring seal, blowing past this seal here. And is, that flame is going directly onto the hydrogen tank. And so eventually what happened was it burned a hole in that tank then the, the shuttle lost its structural integrity, the flame exploded the hydrogen, and um, that was all she wrote. The, uh, sh the shuttle had about 70 seconds of flight before this explosion happened. So here's an example uh, showing some pictures 
they, they're not always easy to see, but the professional NASA, you know, technicians who study these things know exactly what they were looking at. But here's the first time that you can see the integrity of the tank is broken and there's a hydrogen leak. And then here's some more of the hydrogen coming out before it's actually caught on fire. Then here's a side shot. So this is what the orbiter looks like. You can see the tail here and you can see the solid rocket booster here. And this is where the solid rocket boosters uh, nozzle is, and you can see the hydrogen leak coming out of the tank right here. Okay, so that that's a bad sign. And in fact, they see a little bit of glow between the uh, fuselage of the shuttle and the external tank. That glow starts to turn into a flame. Now you're heating up the underbelly of the shuttle itself. It breaks apart. You lose aerodynamic stability, and you're that's all she wrote. So here is the famous picture of the explosion. And uh, this is when you've completely lost the orbiter. And interestingly, they say that the spacecraft was going so fast that these, some of these parts still sell, <coughs> excuse me, quite, quite higher. I think another, you know, 20% of the path that it had taken, they still went up another 20% of that path. And, um, the cabin where the crew was broke off and was intact. And it's believed that the crew survived the initial explosion because some of them had uh, donned uh, their oxygen tanks and had actually breathed through some of the oxygen tank. The oxygen was partially consumed. And it's believed that they basically passed out because of being at such high altitude and low pressure. But they are believed that they were alive when the cabin hit the ocean and it was the impact that, that killed them. Now, their remains have been recovered, but NASA has never, ever released any images or any information or data about what they found. That's very sad. Here's an artist's rendition of what that last moment must have been like during the breakup, just to sort of get a real feel for uh, what that must have been like. Of course, it would happen in a split second. And of course, the last transmission happened at T plus 30 seconds, seven sec 73 seconds, uh, was Michael J. Smith, who was the pilot sitting in the right-hand seat, and he uh, keyed into his mic, uh-oh, and that was the last transmission. Um, it turns out that as the space shuttle goes up, it's, it's building up pressure against the hull as it picks up supersonic speed. And it starts to reach something called max Q, which is the mass, uh, maximum dynamic pressure on the shuttle itself and the entire um, stack of the rockets and the, and the, and the tank. And so they throttle down uh, the main engines just to take a little bit of that pressure off as they go through max Q. Once they pass through max Q, they have something called throttle up. And the, the last set of commands were basically um, that you are go, Challenger, you will go for throttle up and say, Roger, go for throttle up. And uh, then the next thing was, uh-oh, and that was the end of the mission. Another thing very famous about this mission, you'll see that on, on the mission patch, there's a little apple here. That's, a, that's the teacher in space program and Krista McAuliffe had won a spot on the space shuttle uh, through thousands of applicants, I think tens of thousands of applicants. And uh, this was a, a PR thing. The idea was that she was going to teach some classes while in space and really inspire youth to think about space and space-related uh, careers. But unfortunately, she died in the accident. Um, also dying in the accident um, was um, Ronald McNair, and perhaps you've heard of the McNair scholarships. They're basically named after McNair. Um, this is the pilot, Michael J. Smith. This is Francis Scobie. This is Judy Resnick. This is Gregory Jarvis, Krista McAuliffe. And then from Hawaii is um, Ellison Onizuku. How about the Columbia accident? Well, the Columbia accident was a very different accident. Um, you know, in the case of the <clears throat> blow-by that happened on Challenger, the, there were previous missions where they had seen 
situations where the O-rings had failed and some blow by had happened and actually some leakage had happened uh, from that blow by. And so that was one reason why the engineers were, were keyed up on why they shouldn't launch in the cold weather. There was also something else that people were aware of with the space shuttles. Um, and some people thought it was just a matter of time that these two things were gonna kill people. And the other thing was that when the space shuttle takes off, the vibrational load and the pressure on the external tank is very, very severe. And the external tank is made of a sort of spongy, uh, foamy type of material to insulate the, the hyper cold hydrogen and, and hyper cold uh, cryogenically cooled oxygen. So you need this insulation. Well, it turns out that the vibration would knock chunks of this foam loose. And you know when you're accelerating at the rate that the shuttle is, if that foam comes down, it can actually hit you quite hard and, and be like a rock is hitting you. And so this was known that the space shuttle had, had this problem because they'd seen space shuttle tiles knocked off by this foam that happened during liftoff. And the worry was that it would happen in a place on the shuttle that would be critical for the systems when it re-entered. Um, and therefore the shuttle would um, get overheated in that one spot that was um, compromised by the foam hit, and then the shuttle would break apart. And this is exactly what happened in the Columbia accident. Again, seven people lost their lives. And here is a picture of liftoff, and you can see the foam coming off and actually hitting. This is the foam disintegrating after it hits the wing and whatnot. You can see it here. And so this foam actually hit one of the wings. Here's the diagram here. The, you know, the foam came off up here, the external tank, and it hit the wing over here. And it, it basically knocked a small hole in the wing. And if there was a way to examine the space shuttle uh, externally, uh, the crew would have known. But they, they did their full two-week mission. Um, there was discussion that NASA had seen this footage. They, they talked about it. The crew was aware about it. But they all had decided that they really couldn't do anything about it and that they really didn't think, you know, when they did some calculations and they, they, they erred on the side that everybody was going to be safe. And that turned out to not be the case. So this hole was about this spot in the wing. And you can see there, all, all these red things are basically uh, sensors throughout the wing many of them talking about temperature. Some of the sensors actually sensed the pressure in the tire. And um, as this heat came down, as they were coming through re-entry of the atmosphere, the first indication that something was wrong, and you can go to YouTube and you can listen to the footage uh, and watch the mission control people, uh, you know, uh, working with the crew while it's going through re-entry. Of course, the crew was in blackout at the time because of the ionization of the atmosphere that blocked their radio signals. But they were able to monitor many of the things on the craft. And one of them they could monitor was the pressure on the tire. And the first indication you get is that one of the flight controllers says, you know, flight, talking to the flight director, I've lost pressure on, you know, the starboard tire. Um, I guess it was the port tire. So the that was the first indication, you know, we've lost pressure on the tire. And so clearly the tire had, had blown or had, you know, um, melted or one of the cases. So that was the first indication. And then they started to get other indications of hy hydraulics going out and things like that. And then eventually um, they didn't have a signal for, of telemetry. It's what they call it, the signal from the space shuttle. And of course, then they started doing comm checks and you know, it was you know, Houston, Columbia, over, Houston, Columbia, do you read? And there was just no signal until somebody finally said, okay, uh, lock the doors and don't let anybody in. And of course they were all horrified. And meanwhile, they started to get reports that there were these long fireballs that were stretched across uh, Texas. And you could see that if you lived in Dallas, you for sure saw this, but even people from Southern New Mexico were able to see this fireball across the sky. 
here's what the flight path looked like uh, coming in here and um, over over Northern California and then across New Mexico. And then the final, final breakup was just over here before it got to Dallas, Texas. And the plan was for it to come in and land at Kennedy Space Center. And so you see here the first sensors going off and then they start going off in, in rapid succession. Uh, there's time stamps on every one of these things. And then there are pieces that fell at these various locations. To give you an idea how high it is, this is 35,000 feet is jet level height. So they were still very high in the atmosphere. But um, here's a picture of the newspaper. You can see that's horrifying. Uh, I've also, you can go on YouTube and you can see internal footage because they recovered the cameras. You can see internal footage of the, of the astronauts riding the, the ast uh, through reentry until the moment of disintegration. So the space shuttle era ended in 2011 with the final flight of Atlantis. And this is a nice little newspaper article that was published that sort of summarized you sort of your one shot deal of all of the things about the shuttle, including miles flown for each of the various um, uh, orbiters, and then how many uh, missions they flew and what missions, uh, what year they flew, how many crew flew in them, uh, Red Beam Discovery had the biggest number of crew, followed by Atlantis. Uh, obviously, Challenger had the fewest crew members because it had the shortest lifetime. Um, out of the number of men and women, 49 women flew and 306 men knew, and then the distribution by nation. You can see we had Italians, Germans, French, Japanese, Canadian, Russian, and of course, Americans. So during the shuttle era, we built the International Space Station. And of course, this was a uh, tremendous feat. And um, the space station is still operating today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the space station in this particular lecture. But I like to say that the spacecraft payload has inside of it um, a module for the International Space Station, a module for the International Space Station. OK. Um, we will talk more about the International Space Station in a subsequent lecture, but you can see it is quite large and um, a lot of science gets done on, on this space station. But NASA and a lot of the space agencies, I think, do a poor job of teaching what we'll call the person on the street what's really going on in space with the space station. I think if we had built this uh, byway, sort of this cislunar um, trans-cis-lunar network that NASA had originally hoped for, that going back and forth to the moon would be something that would capture the imagination much more. Plus, there is a great deal of science that can be done, and I think it would be more in the mainstream for the typical person. Here is the beautiful uh, set of images from the International Space Station. Um, here we are doing a spacewalk. Again, you can see it's a beautiful thing to work in space at space orbit. I imagine it would be just an ex incredible experience. Uh, much, much better than uh, Space Lab, much higher tech. I mean, since Skylab, you can tell. And here's a perfect example of some of the working. It looks like everybody is working on laptops because they're so much more powerful than anything that was in the space shuttle or anything that was you know, um, in Skylab. This is Mark Kelly. He holds one of the longest duration records in space, and he is a, a medical uh, professional that uh, has now uh, been elected, I think, to Congress uh, in Arizona, and he has a twin brother. And so they did the experiment of having his twin brother uh, live in a controlled way for the entire time that um, Kelly was in space, and then, of course, they came down and they were able to do twin experiments and look at how space had affected Mark Kelly and his life. And apparently, when he got back, uh, it, it was excruciating in many ways. You can go online again and you can, you can hear Mark tell, Kelly tell his story about what it was like to come back and live in a 1G of gravity after that. You know, we learned from Frank White that, indeed, the... Um, 
overview effect is very powerful when you work up there. And so here we have a, a nice picture of Earth gazing, which is one of the favorite pastimes of the astronauts. Uh, and then just experiencing that overview effect and so that when you come back to Earth, that you bring that, that with you and you're changed fundamentally. Now on the last slide, and this is an important slide, is talking about basically the different space stations that have flown in space. And this is gonna be important as we talk about what's coming in the future because uh, there are some amazing plans for space stations, uh, particularly um, inflatable space stations uh, from a, a company called Bigelow Space. And in fact, Bigelow Space has modules already on the International Space Station that they're testing. So this is a timeline across the top, and you can see here's our SALU, uh, one and three and four and seven and five and six, and here's two. Here's our Skylab relative to those. And then here's a mirror that was a workhorse for a couple decades here. And then the International Space Station's been um, manned, if you will, or crewed since the late 1990s and still crewed. Now, something you may not realize um, is in fact that the Chinese have some space stations. They have their Tiangong-1 and their Tiangong-2. They've actually had astronauts uh, fly to their space stations, dock with their space stations, so they know how to do rendezvous and docking, and they actually can do EVAs. So the, do not underestimate the Chinese. They are uh, very good in space now, and we're going to talk about that. But a lot of people aren't aware that they have permanent space stations. Uh, Tiangong 1 has been basically decommissioned, uh, but Tiangong 2 is still actually a functional space station. Um, private companies, Genesis has the Genesis 1 and the Genesis 2, and these are space stations that have been up since the mid aughts of the uh, 2000s. And so uh, there are space stations up there by private companies that people are not aware about. So that's going to be our module three in the class where we start talking about what's up there now and, and what's planned and what's coming and what this all may look like. And maybe we'll get um, sort of long-term visioned and think about what this all might look like in 500 years because that's why we did the sea race because we're 500 years now after the sea race and we can see what the earth is like and what society is like. And uh, we're gonna have a changed society due to all this space activity, this new ocean, this final frontier that we're going out to. So I just wanted to show this to you because I really wanted you to understand that this space station thing is really a thing of the future that's coming and uh, inform you about the Chinese and inform you about the private corporations. So I hope that you've enjoyed today's lecture going over the Skylab, going over the space shuttle. Um, I want you to make sure that you watch the supplementary videos. They're very, very good. They fill in a lot of holes that I didn't talk about and, and will really enrich your experience. Meanwhile, don't forget, you're supposed to be reading out of Andrew Chaikin's A Man on the Moon in preparation for his visit. Okay, everybody have a good day. And next time we come back, we'll talk about the Chinese space program from its inception to the modern day. Take care.